morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes, doctor, we can hear you. Okay, so we are still waiting for some people to join in. No, doctor, we can start. Okay, so today's topic is going to be introduction to hearing loss. I believe you had a lecture on hearing, right? So we'll just have a recap on how do we hear. Um, so we are able to hear when sound waves are collected by the outside ear, as you can see, the pinna does that job. So it collects the sound which enters into the ear canal. Um, because of the S-shaped um, orientation of the canal, it also works to amplify sound. Um, and when also it reaches the eardrum, it causes the eardrum to vibrate. When the eardrum vibrates, it transmits the sound to the ossicles. Uh, and because of the way they are arranged, uh, which is like a lever, it also acts to amplify sound. And this is um, transmitted to the oval window. And from the oval window, it goes to the cochlea. From the cochlea, where the hair cells that's how it goes into the cochlear nerve or the auditory nerve. And it's, it's um, this signal, which, which is no longer sound. It's now an electric signal is transmitted to the brain and we are able to interpret what we are hearing from what has been presented to the ear. So what is hearing loss? So any def a defect at any point, um, of sound trans transduction to interpretation causes us to have hearing loss, causes us not to be able to hear or hear at a very low tone. So there are several types of hearing loss. Um, some of them you've been introduced to and some you may not have been introduced to. Um, one of those and the commonest is conductive hearing loss. And basically here, the problem is uh, basically at the outer ear, eardrum or the ossicles. So if you have either blockage in the outer ear, let's say if it's caused by wax, a foreign body or an infection that is um, blocking the ear canal, you, the sound will not be able to travel um, very well to the eardrum. Um, if you have a perforation in the eardrum, it will not be able to vibrate well in order to transmit the sound to the ossicles. If you have a problem with the ossicles themselves, either a dislocation or something like ankylosis where they are stiff, they will not be able to transmit the sound that has been presented to you to the inner ear. If you also have fluid, within the middle ear. Um, it will not allow the eardrum to be able to vibrate well. So you lose sound, you'll not be able to hear well. But that resultant hearing loss is what we call conductive hearing loss. For sensory neuro hearing loss, um, the problem is at the level of your cochlea here or at the nerve. So if, if you have anything that damages the hair cells within the cochlea or something that causes damage to the nerve itself, um, then you're going to end up with sensory neuro hearing loss. Um, so the other, the other type of hearing loss is a mixed hearing loss, whereby you have a conductive aspect as well as sensory neuro loss. That means somewhere along the outer ear, eardrum, or middle ear ossicles, there's, there's a problem. And then either the cochlea and or, or the cochlear nerve have, have a problem. So you end up with a mixed hearing loss. It's not only conductive, there's also a sensory, sensory neural aspect of it. And, and the other type of hearing loss is the, central hearing loss. 
And this is basically, you have a problem at the central nervous system. The ear may be normal, both, I mean, all the outer, middle and inner ear could be normal. The nerve may be normal, but something in the brain, um, if you have maybe brain atrophy, if you, um, if you, if you have a tumor in the brain that is com compressing on the um, auditory center, you'll have hearing loss, but uh, having a central nervous system problem. Not, not the, the ear itself will not have a problem, but the point where the sound is supposed to be interpreted, that's where your hearing loss will be. So what causes hearing loss? There are several causes. For example, hereditary, noise induced. And when we talk about hereditary, it's a third of the cases of sensory neural hearing loss are hereditary. It could be in association with uh, a con uh, other congenital problems where, where it's um, in combination with a syndrome. For example, Trichard Collins syndrome and this, you may find that you could also have um, ear abnormalities, whereby either the outer ear, middle ear, or inner ear um, were abnormally formed congenitally. Um, the other the other cause is non-syndromic, um, and this can be congenital or late onset. By late onset, we mean that um, the hearing loss started after birth. For congenital, when the child is checked, maybe um, in places where they do hearing screening, you find that even um, at birth, they already have an, a hearing impairment. So these uh, for for hereditary so you're you're very interested in finding out if there's any family history um or people with hearing loss uh and then you can be able to trace it uh for noise induced there are several forms um there's what we call acoustic acoustic trauma and this is sudden intense sound and it's usually of a short duration and because we measure sound in dB, this usually exceeds 140 dB. So that means it is very loud. Um, and a good example is a gunshot. So for example, if someone um, fires a gun next to your ear, you're likely to get an acute acoustic trauma. And this one basically just uh, destroys the hair cells within the ear and you lose your hearing of certain frequencies. It may not be all the frequencies, but certain frequencies within um, your hearing capacity. The other one is blast injury. So for this one, it's still also very loud, but it has a higher pressure um, than, than the, um, the acute, I mean, the acute acoustic trauma. And here, the pressure is, so high to the extent that the tympanic membrane will rupture and at times even the ossicles themselves get dislocated or disrupted. So you're having actually a, a damage to the eardrum, you may have damage to the ossicles even before it gets to the hair cells themselves. So such people, for example, if they've been in a bomb blast, um, they will come with bleeding from the ear because of the rupture of the eardrum. The other one could be acute noise induced hearing loss. And this is basically exposure to high levels of, of continuous sound. It may be reversible or it could be, sorry, this it's, it's either reversible or partially, I mean, partially, partially reversible. Um, so usually, let's say the commonest example is when you're using high power tools. For example, someone using a chainsaw or um, other very loud, um, a motor of some form. Um, it can be jet, uh, sound of a jet. Um, I mean, for, 
for many of us who want to go out for concerts um, when you're exposed to very loud sound. So usually you leave that place having a muffled sensation. You may or may not have tinnitus. Basically, that loud sound is has caused damage to your hair cells and um, you're not transmitting the sound well. So like I said earlier, it, it's either reversible or partially reversible. It's either irreversible. The first statement is supposed to be irreversible, or it could be partially reversible. So that, um, that tells us that we need to be careful because something that can happen once can actually damage your hearing forever. So you have to be a lot more cautious um, when you're going to very loud places or um, things like um, that kind of equipment. There's actually supposed to be a minimum amount of time that you're supposed to spend in areas that have very loud noise, noises. For example, the next point is talking about chronic noise-induced hearing loss. And um, the people who are really affected are those that are in very loud places. Uh, talk of, for example, um, factories where the machines are making a lot of sound. So for the different levels of noise, we are supposed to be exposed to them for a limited period of time. For example, sounds that are above 85 dB um, of sound or noise, someone shouldn't be working in that area for more than eight hours per day. I mean, they should be less than that if they want to keep their hearing. But then again, also in people that are prone to being in places with loud noises, it's better the, that they have protection protection for their ears. So this can be in form of ear inserts um, or headphones to sort of protect their ears from that constant sound. So the other causes of hearing loss, it could be a traumatic injury to the inner ear. Uh, and this can be as a result of head trauma. For example, if someone has, uh, has had an RTA or um, may be assaulted. Um, and this can be either contusion or concussion, whichever it is. Or you could actually get um, temporal bone fracture from the trauma. And this of course disrupts, may disrupt the inner ear and cause hearing loss. Um, then the other cause could be labyrinthitis. And this is caused by either infection or inflammation. So for infection, it's basically through three main routes. Uh, you have tympanogenic, meningeal, or hematogenous. Tympanogenic, that means the infection is within the ear. So it's within the middle ear. For example, um, if you have acute otitis media, or if you have chronic otitis media, this, this infection can be transmitted to the inner ear via the oval or round window, and you end up with an infection in there. Or it could either be that um, the, the medication that has been put in the inner ear or, um, or the inflammation itself, um, it goes into the, the labyrinth and that causes, um, it causes hearing loss. Um, the other thing is for the meningeal aspect, that means that the infection itself is within the intracranial cavity. So from the meninges, it can move into the inner ear via the internal acoustic miniatus. Um, and the other aspect, is for the hematogenous spread, spread, for example, if you have a viral infection, um, for viral infection, for example, mumps, uh, measles, CMV, uh, HIV, this can be transmitted by blood to the labyrinth and you end up with an inflammation in there. And with the inflammation, you have vestibular symptoms as well as the cochlear symptoms. So you have hearing loss and 
and uh, vestibular disturbances, for example, let's say vertigo and so on. So the other aspects um, that can cause your hearing loss is autotoxicity. There are several drugs that either vestibular toxic or cochlear toxic. When I say vestibular toxic, that means they damage the vestibular system and for the cochlear toxic are the ones that will actually give you hearing loss because they damage the cochlea, either the hair cells or the blood supply to the cochlea and you end up with hearing loss. So usually um, examples of the drugs, you find that there are some chemotherapy agents, uh, the, plat the platinums, uh, and the commonest of which, which uh, we use in head and neck cancer is cisplatin. It causes the, the most, um, it's the most autotoxic. In fact, if you if someone requires, um, if they have head and neck cancer and they require chemotherapy, it's imperative that you do a baseline hearing test. And the baseline hearing test that you do is a pure tone audiometry so that you find out. If someone is already predisposed, they already have a hearing loss, you would not want to give them cisplatin. Maybe you consider another um, treatment that is available and that can be able to work for them. Um, the other examples, you have uh, diuretics like frusamide, you have aminoglycosides, um, for example, gentamicin. Um, so there are actually several drugs. You have anti-TB drugs, um, for example, streptomycin. So for these different treatments, one has to be cautious. Sometimes you have to weigh the benefits um, versus the harm that they are going to cause. At times you don't have alternatives to the medication. So it's imperative that you explain this to the patient so that they are aware and they make an informed decision so that they don't come back later to you because of the hearing loss and you actually have no idea uh, what was their, their hearing loss. Um, the other cause of hearing loss um, is presbycusis, and this is common among the elderly 50 years and above. So just like um, age affects the different systems in the body, the age also affects hearing as well. So you have um, hair cells actually getting damaged. For some people, they have a genetic predisposition to presbyacusis, others it's because of the, it's accentuated by the various exposures, for example, drugs that they've been using over time. It could be things like chronic illnesses like diabetes um, uh, or hypertension, because you know, even with the, the chronic illnesses, there's also as well as medication that is being taken. So you find that someone with a predisposition also has, there's an interplay um, between other, other things that can lead them to get um, presbyacusis, which is um, normally bilateral because you have whatever is affecting one ear has to affect the other ear as well. If it is the edge, I mean, it's not only one ear that is growing old, it's both of them. So it's usually bilateral. There's also what we call sudden sensory neuro hearing loss. This is usually idiopathic, like you cannot point to a certain cause. For some, it may be as a result of viral infection. So for, for, for the sudden sensory neuro hearing loss, you have a person having developing hearing loss uh, within seconds to days. So initially they were fine, they had no problem. Then all of a sudden, I mean, their hearing goes down. It can be a progressive one. It may be non-progressive, but yes, you could have that. So for someone who you're suspecting to have hearing loss, what can you do? What tests can you do to confirm this or to sort of um, classify it into either conductive or sensory neural? Uh, one of the things that you can do in clinic um, are the tuning fork tests. Um, you have the Reins test and then the Weber's test. Uh, 
best, I think we've been, this is not the first time we're hearing about this. Basically you're using tuning forks and they are of different frequencies. You have the 512, which is most commonly available and uh, most commonly used or preferred. And for the RINES test, you're basically testing um, air conduction and bone conduction. Air conduction is supposed to be, someone is supposed to hear better through air conduction. Why? Because when sound, if we go back to the picture of the ear that we saw, when the sound is presented to the, to the pin, the shape of the pin is supposed, it, it funnels the sounds. That means it concentrates the sound into the ear canal. Then the shape of the the shape of the auditory canal itself it's S shaped, and we know sound waves are sinusoidal, right? So even this shape of the ear also acts to amplify the sound. When you look at the eardrum, I mean, if you look at this um, surface area where the sound hits the eardrum, and then you compared to this, this is supposed to be your, your step is foot plate. This is 50 times, I mean, 55 times way bigger than this. So you find that sound is focused here. So all these work to amplify, to amplify your sound. So whatever is presented here is amplified here. Um, so if you cut this off, uh, I mean, when you have bone conduction, you're having, you're presenting sound directly to the cochlea. That means you're cutting off all this, which is supposed to amplify your sound. So you'd have, you end up getting lower, lower, you, you hear the sound will be less, less than what would have been presented by the, from the outer ear through the middle ear to the, to the inner ear. So, so for these tests, um, so RAIN's test, um, air conduction is supposed to be better than bone conduction. But for someone with a conductive hearing loss, you find that their bone conduction is better than air conduction because it's something that is blocking or that has affected outer ear, eardrum, or the middle ear through the ossicles. And for Weber's test, um, the ear with the with a conductive loss, the sound you you basically want to you basically want to it's supposed to help you find where the conductive loss is. The the sound lateralizes to the ear with a conductive loss. So you find that when you when you hit that um that tuning fork and you put it on the vertex of the head, the sound is transmitted via the bone. So for, for Weber's, you don't have air conduction, you're directly stimulating the bone. So for someone that has um, a conductive loss, you find that the sound lateralizes to the conductive, I mean, to the ear with the conductive loss. So you're able to tell which side has a conductive loss or not. Um, so for the other tests, we have the pure tone audiometry. And for pure tone audiometry, just like the name says pure tone, that means sound is presented at a specific frequency. Um, let's look at this. This is an audiogram. Uh, audiogram, that means, uh, for the pure tone, it's a pure tone audiogram. So you find that sound, this up here is the frequency. So sound is presented to an ear at, at different frequencies. You have, usually we start from 250, 500, 1000, 2000, 4000, 8000. And then there are also frequencies that are in between that, that really they don't um, check on a routine basis, it's only, special occasions or when you're suspecting certain things that you check them. So these, these appear the standard ones. So you find sound is presented to you to do in different frequencies. And then here 
is the hearing level. So this is the intensity of the sound or the loudness of the sound. You start at negative 10, 0, 10, going up. So when you're presenting the sound, usually, um, let's say, uh, most commonly we start with 1,000. You present at zero dB. If they're not able to hear, to hear the sound, then you increase it to 10. If they're not able to hear, you increase it to 20. If still they're not able to hear at 20, you increase it to 30. So until you get uh, what we call the threshold where they're actually hearing the sound, and that is what you plot, okay? So you do that for the different, for the different frequencies. From 1,000, usually you go backwards to 500, and then for 250. And then you can go 2,000, 4,000, 8,000. So for the different frequencies, you find their threshold. Where is their threshold? And, um, the sound is presented uh, via air conduction. That means an actual tone is presented to the ear via the head headsets or um, yeah. And there's also supposed to give you um, for for the pure tone audiometry is going to give you the threshold for air conduction, and it will also give you a threshold. Sorry. It will also give you a threshold for, for it will give you a threshold for bone conduction and air conduction as well. And as, as we know, I mean, uh, for this one, they should be rather on the same, for a normal ear, uh, we expect that threshold is, is less than 20 and the bone and air conduction should be basically on the same level. So bone and air conduction should be on the same level. So where, where you find that, let's assume that this was for bone conduction and this is your air conduction. So where we find that the bone is better than air, yeah? Because we said air conduction is supposed to be the better transmission. I mean, it involves the outer ear, middle ear, which uh, amplifies sound. So sound is supposed to be better. But for the pure tone, they are usually on the same line for a normal ear. Where you find that bone is better than air conduction, then that means you have a conductive loss. You, there's something either in the external ear canal, either your eardrum has a problem, or your middle ear has a problem. So you, you, you end up with what we call an airborne gap. Um, if let's say at 1000, this is what the threshold was for bone. And at, um, at 1000, this is a threshold for, for air conduction. Between them, I mean, between these, these different, the DBs, this is the airborne gap. And where you have airborne gap, that means you have a conductive hearing loss. So for um, so for what we we'll call a sensory neural hearing loss, uh, usually you have the bone and the air not way below the twenty dB. So you find maybe both of them are maybe at thirty or forty at the different frequencies. So that tells us it's a sensory neuro. So it could be 80. So depending on how far below, that will also determine the severity of the hearing loss. Where you have 20 to, 20 to 40 as mild, if your threshold are between 20 to 40, that will be mild hearing loss. Um, 40 to 60, it will be moderate. And, um, and then, be, be beyond that, it will be severe hearing loss. So the um, pure tone audiometry helps you to, first of all, um, car, I mean, classify, is it conductive loss or is it um, sensory neural or is it mixed hearing loss? A mixed loss, you have an airborne gap, but then again, your bone is also 
the the bond threshold is not um, in the normal range. So, so you can you are, you can be able to tell um, sensory neural conductive or a mixed hearing loss. So the other tests that we can do, for example, if you've done the Weber's test and you're not sure, is it a conductive loss? For example, the case where you have sensory neural loss, where you have a sensory neural loss, I mean, you find that um, for Renee's test, it will be, it will be normal, it will appear normal. Weber's, it will not lateralize. That's that. That is if uh, both ears, they they are sort of in the same range, um, or equally affected. Um, the other test that you can do is tympanometry. For tympanometry, um, a probe is inserted into the ear, an ear probe, and this um, provides different pressures to the ear, and um, a sound and different pressures to the ear, and at the different pressures, it, it you test how how um, how compliant or how well the eardrum moves with the sound that is provided. And basing on the different pressures, as you can see, these are these are tympanogram curves. So you see that. The ear, the eardrum was moved best at this point, which is almost at zero. Yeah. So when 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 you have pressure in the outer ear canal and pressure within the middle ear equal, you find that um, at this point where both pressures are equal. You, you have the best movement of the eardrum. So when someone has a normal ear, normal outer ear and normal inner ear, I mean, normal middle ear, you have this, the, the peak at zero. So that means at this point, pressure at the outer ear canal is the same as that in the middle ear canal. No, then you have the best conduction. So here, uh, this will be a type A tympanogram. So if the peak is closer to zero for type A, this is the normal. This is what we call normal. For type B, that means you present different pressures to the ear, but you fail to get any peak. This can happen if the eardrum is not moving. So I mean, you, you prevent, present your negative pressure, negative 200, then you go on positive pressure, but still, I mean, the eardrum is basically not moving. So this can happen when you have middle ear pressure. Uh, I mean, middle ear fluid. For middle ear fluid, um, of course, it restricts the movement of the, it, re it restricts movement of the eardrum. So you will not have any peak. Um, then the other one is a type C where you're having your peak in the negative pressure. So this one, anyway, it's usually if they have negative pressure within the middle ear and they are hearing better when you're providing negative pressure to the ear. Yes, yeah. so the other test, uh, you have what we have speech audiometry. I'm not going to focus much on that. Um, the key things that you need to know are the tuning fork tests, uh, and then you should have an idea about pure tone audiometry and then tympanometry. So um, for someone who you're suspecting to have hearing loss, how do you manage them? The first key to management is prevention. Prevention, prevention. Um, actually, 70% of hearing loss is caused by preventable causes. Um, for example, we saw that noise is one of the commonest causes, causes of hearing loss. So for people who work in loud environments, for example, let's say factory workers or people like soldiers who are always firing arms or um, environments where you have um, loud sound for any, any sort of reason, they are supposed to have ear protection. So you have things like earplugs, headphones to sort of um, 
um, protect their ears from the loud sound. So prevention is key. And then also the other aspect, if um, you're providing autotoxic medication, uh, for example, like we said, chemotherapy, cisplatin, um, usually these patients are monitored. Ideally, they're supposed to be monitored. And where you find that there's a loss, you're supposed to stop the medication or give an alternative that doesn't, that is not autotoxic to prevent further damage to the ear. And then for people who are found to already have a hearing loss, um, these ones, you can either modify the environment, for example, um, I mean, um, trying to provide a quiet environment. If it's a child in school, you find that you ask the teacher maybe to place them at the front of the class um, so that they can be able to hear better. Or you could use assistive devices. For example, you have hearing aids. Um, you could have microphones to sort of increase the sound that is provided to the ear. So this is basically dependent on how bad the hearing loss is and what type of hearing loss will affect um, the ears. Yes. So do we have any questions? Yes, doctor, I have a question, two questions. Mm, okay. So my first question is regarding the investigation. Is this necessary to do all of them or is there an algorithm that is used maybe um, to direct the decision on diagnosis? Mm. And then um, the second one is on treatment. Mm. Uh, recently, I saw a tweet about a surgery that was done to, to cure a hearing loss. I don't know how trees that is, but I wanted to know if there's any surgeries that can be done to people who have lost their hearing. Okay, to answer your first question, you asked about um, is there an algorithm for hearing tests? And basically, like we said, that usually your 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 history your history and examination are, best, are going to direct your test. Um, the easiest tests that you can do in the clinic are tuning fork tests. Um, if you've examined and someone has wax in their ear, so and you do your Ryan's and Weber's and it's um, it's lateralizing to that ear. So you know if they've complained about hearing loss, the loss is because of the wax. You're going to take out that wax. You don't need to do these other tests. You don't need to do pure tonodiometry. Or if you've examined and you find someone has a perforation in their eardrum, so you know that the conductive loss is because of the perforation. So you may do the pure tone audiometry if you want to act on it, or if you want to get a threshold to know how bad is their hearing loss. So the tests usually are directed by what you're suspecting. We usually do tympanometry for someone who we expect to have fluid within the middle ear. So if you're not suspecting someone to have fluid, there's, there's no point. Um, if you've already found a diagnosis that they have works, you don't have to do any of these other tests. Yes. So that was for your first question. The second question was um, the question of surgery. Uh, so there are, there are different surgeries that can be done, and these are best on what is causing the hearing loss. If we have a conductive loss, that means um, maybe you have a perforation in the eardrum. Uh, there are surgeries, for example, to repair that perforation. They're called tympanoplasty or meringoplasty. So you, you basically get a graft and you put it over or over the perforation and this person can be able to hear better because they're not losing the sound via the perforation. Um, you could have people that have lost or who have had um, um, ossicular fractures or dislocations, 
the, the actually prosthesis that can be put in the middle ear and are connected to the eardrum and are able to transmit this sound. For, for cases where you have um, damage um, to the cochlea, I think you, you, you've heard of cochlear implants. So basically something that looks like um, a, um, something that is supposed to stimulate the nerve at the different uh, frequencies is placed into the cochlea and this uh, acts as what their cochlea, their new cochlea, if they've lost, um, if they've had cochlear damage, you have, you can use uh, cochlear implants to hear. So I guess, I hope that answers your question. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Any uh, more thank questions? you. Yes, please. Thank you, Dr. Ruth, for the lecture. My question is uh, uh, my question concerns children who are born deaf and dumb. Mm -hmm. I believe this could be a central hearing loss. My first question is why do they occur concurrently in most cases? Then, too, I've seen such children being given hearing aids mounted at the mastoid bone. Now, does that mean a hearing aid can solve a central hearing loss? Thank you. Okay, so thank you for the question. You say deaf and dumb. So dumb means they don't speak. We only learn how to speak through hearing. So for someone who does not hear, they cannot, I mean, for someone who is not able to hear within those first years, the first three years of life, they cannot be able to acquire speech because we acquire speech through hearing. So for those children um, in places where you have neonatal screening, that means a child is born and they are test for their hearing. Um, it does not necessarily mean that they do not hear at all. Sometimes, like I said, hearing loss has degrees or it has severity. It could be mild, it could be moderate, it could be severe. So if it's when, when in places where you have screening, hearing screening for those children, when you find a child has a hearing loss, you're supposed to aid them early on. That means before you do anything, this child needs to be presented with sound. Otherwise, if you don't provide them with sound, they will never be able to speak they cannot learn speech. They cannot be, a, that part of their brain is not able to function um, if they've not been hearing. And uh, like I said, for the, the central hearing loss is a problem in the brain. For a child who has been born, you, you need to find out what has caused their hearing loss. Is it a hereditary cause? Is it because of a birth trauma? that has caused their hearing loss. So for the different causes, you can either aid the ear or that's why they, they, they give them hearing aids. So the first step is to give a hearing aid. If the hearing aid is not helping, then you consider doing things, surgeries like cochlear implants. I hope I've answered you. Any more questions? Yes, doctor. I, I have a question, two questions. It's still open. Okay, okay. I think they are asked. Yes, so my first question is in uh, noise induced hearing loss, is there mm. a difference in sensitivity to, to the noise between the hair cells in the bacilla part of the, in the basal part of the bacilla membrane compared to the apex? So that uh, uh, can you, you can you can you ask your question again? Yes, yeah, so in noise induced hearing loss, mm. is there a dif difference in sensitivity? of the mm. hair cells, a mm. part of the basilar membrane compared to the apex 
And then uh, the second is in children who have meningitis by developing also labyrinthitis. So do we mm. still maintain the treatment for meningitis, the antibiotics, or we also need to, to change and add steroids, something like that? Do they change in management for the children? Okay, so um, I'll answer your, the, your first question first. You, you asked about noise-induced hearing loss. Um, if there's a difference between the hair cells at the base of the cochlea to those in the apex. So we know that the arrangement of the hair cells for the different frequencies, you find that someone is able to hear the high frequencies of sound at the base at the base of the cochlea, and then low frequency sounds at the apex. When you're presented with sound, it passes through the base, then goes to the apex. So you find that um, the, that in noise, um, because this sound, whatever, whatever sound it is, is provided at a very high intensity. That means it is loud. Even if it is high frequency, even if it's a low frequency sound, it's going to start off at the best where you're hearing your high frequency. It will start off at the best whereby the high frequency will be, um, will you be able to detect the high frequency at the best and the low frequency will actually go through the whole cochlea to the apex. So you find that uh, the most damage is at the base of the cochlea. Why? Because that is where all the sound starts from. And because it is very loud, those, those um, hair cells at the best get damaged first. So you find that usually for noise-induced hearing loss, it's usually the high frequency loss first. Because we say at the base of the cochlea, that is where you detect your high frequency from. But it's the damage is not because of only the, the, the high frequencies, it's because whatever you're presenting to the ear is first going to go through the best. So it will damage those hair cells. So you find that someone has a loss at 2,000, 4,000, 8,000. Okay? So it's, it's because the intensity of the sound is very high at the best. And by the time it goes to the apex, it has, the intensity has gone down. But because of the high intensity presented at the best, you find that damage is most at the best, and that's where you have the hearing loss. Then you asked about meningitis. Um, is there any treatment that you can you can add? Or so you find now meningitis is a special thing. Um, when you have meningitis and you end up with labyrinthitis. Even when you, it, it doesn't matter what medication you give you, um, if you're giving steroids or if you're not giving steroids, it's the inflammation itself in the, yeah, in the labyrinth that is going to give you hearing loss. And the problem is that usually that after the inflammation or the infection in the labyrinth, you have um, a sort of like, um, ossification. That means the, the, the fluid in the labyrinth turning into bone. And of course, when you, I mean, when you have the fluid turning into bone, then you are not able to actually get the different waves and be able to stimulate the cochlea. So what is advisable in centers that have the facilities is that for children that have had meningitis, you actually need to to test their hearing immediately after. And when if they have any loss, it is recommended that they get cochlear implantation as soon as possible because um, that bone is going, I mean, it's the, the fluid is going to become into bone after the labyrinthitis, which doesn't happen for all the other labyrinthitis. It's the meningitis, the, the one caused by meningitis that usually leads to that. So when it comes to meningitis, we have to be extra cautious. Most cases, they will require cochlear implantation.
Any more questions? Yes, um, thank you so much, doctor. My question is, uh, in our setting, do we do use tryptamycin for children? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I've TB. not had the first part. I've not had the first part of your question. Could you ask again? Uh, I was asking, but do we use tryptamycin in the treatment of TB as a second line uh, for children who, well, let's say, um, maybe under three years in Uganda? Uh, okay, I am not very conversant with the TB treatment. Uh, do you hear me? I think you asked something about do we use streptomycin uh, for children under three years in Uganda? And unfortunately, I'll need to, to find that out. I am not sure of the treatment regimen for children below three years. Uh, I'm not sure if they use streptomycin, but the driving yes, force. Yes, that's what I asked, yes. Yes, I am. I am not sure, I'm not certain about that. But also the treatment is guided, either someone has, um, cause that is not, that would not be the first line of treatment anyway. Uh, treatment is, is, is based on the fact if someone has drug resistance or no drug resistance. If they don't have drug resistance, then the first line medication would go, they would go for the first line medication, which doesn't include streptomycin. So it has to do with the sensitivity. It's not routinely used. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Rose. I wanted to respond to Jonathan's question. In mm. Uganda, in Uganda, children who are either HIV positive or not, when you are treating TB, either OPP in malnutrition, streptomycin has been phased out even in adults. Mm. We use the first line regimen two, RH, two months of RH and four months of EH. So streptomycin cannot factor anywhere in children with the TB when we are managing them. This is at hospital level, general hospital level, district level, and health center fours. But they've been rolled down even to health center threes. So streptomycin is nowhere. It has been phased out only in research center, maybe in Mulago. That's where they can reserve. Otherwise, if you for management of TB in children, First, first two months is RH, and then next four months is EH. Streptomycin does not factor in. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for the response. Any more questions? Uh, questions over. Yes, Dr. Ruth, thank you so much. I'm not seeing any more questions and any hands raised. Okay, so we are going to have a tutorial on Wednesday. I, I don't know which group we are having, uh, but we'll have a tutorial on Wednesday at 10. And then, uh, for the group that is supposed to be in the department, it will go on as usual. And then uh, the, the rest of the program will be as the rest of the groups have been. And then we'll have the clinical exam on Friday. I'll be conducting that clinical exam. So for next week, we are left with only one lecture, which is the for the tracheostomy indications and complications. Yeah. If there's no other communication, you can have a good day. See you when you come to the department. <laughs>